Uh, so add-ins, or sometimes known as plugins or um, apps, I've seen some people do very good, interesting things with add-ins, but also in my experience I've seen a lot of people barely use them at all. Um, sometimes people will have them installed and they'll still never use them, not get anything out of them. It might be they just they don't know what it's for, or very often they just they really just don't, no one's shown them how to use it. So I thought, well, this is something I could come and talk about at MRUG. But in particular, I'd really like to also you know, find out what other people are using in terms of add-ins and you know, how they're getting something out of it for perhaps future uh, MRUG presentations. Okay, so first of all, I'd say that um, I appreciate that some people, they've perhaps got limited access to add-ins. It might be, especially if it's something you have to pay for, or you might have some restrictions when it comes to installing things. So uh, the, the few apps I've chosen today, I've gone right back to the very basic ones, freely accessible ones, and tried to bear that in mind. Um, but what I would say is worth saying that when it comes to people in your organisation, perhaps you make the purchasing decisions or... Um, who set the IT policy, when they ask you questions like this, um, if you know more about something you're interested in, if you know more sp and you can explain more specifically about how it's going to enhance your productivity or improve your outputs, it puts you in a very good position to you know, make a case for getting them in. So why do we use add-ins? Well, it might be that it does something that Revit doesn't do out of the box. It might be, uh, very often it could be sort of a couple of things that Revit does, but it brings them together in a, a sort of quicker, easier to use, a, in a much smarter way. And sometimes, well, it just takes those tedious, repetitive tasks and it automates them and it makes uh, easy work of something quite repetitive. Well, whether you're a beginner or you're advanced, whatever discipline that you're in, um, there's likely a there's going to be an add-in that you can use. You've got things for editing family content, for um, visualisation, quantification, um, data analysis, document control, pretty much you name it. And very briefly, where do you get them from? Well, there's the usual places. If you're in any kind of um, Revit Autodesk contract, you'll have access to uh, some free Autodesk add-ins. We've got the App Store, which has got literally hundreds of add-ins and plugins from Autodesk and many third-party developers. Some of them you go direct to Autodesk products websites to download. And obviously there's many other third-party providers you can go to their websites and get them. Uh, for those of you who are regular attendees at MRUG, you'll know that there have been previous presentations on add-ins. Uh, this one, a uh, couple of years ago, there's a very good section on apps with a whole series of apps that uh, Rob and Joachim and Daniel Barber um, sort of summarised and briefly highlighted. So today's presentation, I'm not wanting to go over any old ground, but I thought what I'd really like to do, what I'd really like to see more of, I suppose, at MRUG, is more focused um, demonstrations of add-ins uh, to actually see how they work, see them in action, we get a better idea of, of, of how you know, we could actually use them in our own workflows. So, as I said, what I want to do is go right back to some very basic ones, some freely available ones, things that most people have access to, but still, as I find, many people um, still not even using them. And there's one that I always feel that if you're taking your model into Navisworks, this is an absolute must-have. So, how this works, I'm just going to show five apps and a brief video clip of each of them. This one, Batch Print, well I've thrown this one in really because it kind of completes the set. Um, anybody to say who's on a subscription or maintenance uh, sort of uh, enterprise contract will have had access to these in previous releases, but it's worth noting that this one and, and some of the others, they're now included as standard in the Revit 2018 installation, so they come in when you install Revit 2018, they're already there as an add-in. Uh, so this particular one, the first question I asked, and I've certainly heard other people ask, the obvious one is, well, how is it different to the selection sets that you already use within Revit? Um, one thing it can do is you can change the order that the prints come out. 
But on the downside, you can't print to a PDF or any other virtual print drive, and there are some print selection issues. So this is not a particular favourite of mine, but in the way of uh, tips and tricks, just talk you through this one. So by way of comparison, if you go into the um, regular Revit printing, you see you can select a printer, you can pick your, your page layout and size. And what I particularly like built into Revit, if you've, you, you go to your selection sets, you can select a bunch of sheets, you can save them with the name so that next time you come in to print a batch of drawings, uh, you can easily select them. So that's what's already built into Revit. So how does the batch print differ from that? Oh, hang on, hang on, hang on, I'm on a video here. <laughs> <laughs> what? So you've got a batch of drawings, some are air one landscape, some are air Oh, yeah, I'll ask questions in just a second. Hang on, let me run through this video and I'll show you. Yeah. <laughs> He's ready to make a run for it, that's why. So, right, let's have a quick look then. How does the batch print tool actually differ from that? Well, if we first go into it, you see you've got your, your views in your sheets and you can select a bunch of sheets. Exactly the same as you can do in Revit anyway. And what's different here, which is quite nice, is you can reorder them. So if you're sending them to a printer, and there's a lot of them, you can determine what order you want these to come out in, go away, make a cup of tea, come back and collect your prints. But if you, as I say, if you go to print to a PDF, you find it will fail, it won't do it. So how do you change the printer? Well, here's a little tip. It's really annoying. Actually, what you have to do is, before you even start the tool, you need to go into Windows uh, devices and printers, set your default printer there, and even set your setups there. So my tip and trick for this one is, pretty much it's not got a lot of use, but it answers that question, what's it there for? In answer to Phil's question, no, you can't mix and match different page sizes. So again, it doesn't really give you, in that respect, anything different from what you can already do in Revit. So, much more positive note about the other add-ins I'm going to show you today. So, say that was there just to complete the set. Uh, E-Transmit's a really good one. Again, in previous versions, it comes in with your subscription or your maintenance contract. In Revit 2018, it's included in straight out of the box. This one, I find people not using it nearly enough. It's really good at packaging your Revit model, um, ready for issuing out of the office with all the associated files that you want to be including with it which I'll demonstrate in a moment. It'll upgrade older versions and models. It's quite a useful tool for that. We'll detach it from the central, so all your work sharing models. Um, we'll go through that in a moment, but that's a really important thing to do before you send it out in the office. It will strip out your sheets and your views, but it has a limited control on this, so I'm going to sneak another little tool in there briefly that I like to use as part of this workflow, uh, a thing called a project cleaner, which gives you more control over stripping out the sheets and views. So again, video demonstration. Oh, I've gone. How do I go back? Is it playing? Technical issues. It's not playing, Rob. Yeah, it'll be that little thing, Mike, installed, won't it? Okay, so very quickly going through this. First thing to note here is um, if there's a, anybody else working in the model, including yourself, uh, you won't be able to start your transmit. Everybody needs to be out of the model. So before you start this process, get everybody to synchronise and close. So to start the tool, you'll select your project file. You'll select where you want the output package to go to. And I'll just talk you through briefly some of the other settings. So you can create transmittal and error reports, if we look at the end. Uh, and this is a good bit, so you can include any other files that are there related to your model, whether they're linked files, DWGs, DWFs. A useful one is to include your keynote file. And if you are using any decal images, if you don't include these, all you'll see is blank space where your decal image should have been. 
after the package. And this is a nice feature here, adding in any other file, so they might not actually be in your Revit model, things like maybe a specification or some uh, sort of 3D images or some just some PDF drawings that you want to include in there. So it just at the end of it, you get a nice little kind of package of information ready to send out of your office. Now, in terms of upgrading, I think in the last presentation we had on apps at MRUG, um, this app was mentioned, File Upgrader, which is undoubtedly a better tool for upgrading files, but unfortunately, I found it's now no longer free. I think it's about $99 now. So it's worth mentioning that eTransmit, um, it is a good tool for upgrading. Not as good, but it's useful. Uh, disabling work sets. That's very important, as everyone who knows who does work sharing with the central model and local files. If you've ever had this error message when you've opened somebody else's model, it's because all they've done is given you a copy of their central work sharing file. So what you want to do is not make the same mistake. You'll need to be disabling the work sharing, that is to disable the work sets. So eTransmit makes it nice and easy. Of course, good practice, purge out anything that's unused. Okay, so say here you've got some control over the uh, sheets and views that you leave in. You can't go right down to individual sheets, so you can't sort of just pick out your splash screen in a couple of 3D. So um, I'll show you briefly what it can do, and then I'll show you quickly the tool I like to use after this process. So you can go and you can pick out selected view types. So if you want to keep so all of your floor, floor plans or all of your 3D views, you can do that. But I just like to keep it on, including all sheets and all views, and use another tool for that. So once you click the Transmit Model button, Revit will package <coughs> it all up into a folder for you. So have a look at that in Explorer. First of all, you've got your transmittal reports. It's a simple text file. It tells you what was included in there, tells you if anything was missed out. You've got your model file itself, which is say is detached now from the central, and you've got an error report, which might be helpful. So this is the other tool I like to use just as part of that workflow. Um, very quick final step. It's worth saying that this BIM Manager Suite, it's got a great set of tools, but very, very expensive. What it does have, though, is three tools in there that are free. You uh, can download the application, install it. You can use these tools. You don't need a license at all. So I'll show you how that works. So if we start the tool, all of these tools up here in the dark blue, if you click on any of those without a license you won't be able to use them. But over here on the left, so we've got three completely free to use tools and the one I like to use in this workflow is a project cleaner. It's extremely simple, very quick. What I like about this is you can drill down and see every view, schedule, legend, sheet within your project. <coughs> so when you're ready, you just select everything that you want to remove and deselect anything that you're wanting to keep in your model. So remember to get it that way round. And when you're done, you click on the remove button. And as quick as Dynamo, it <coughs> gives you a warning and it will strip out all of those views and sheets and links. So your model's almost ready for sending. Those are the things that I chose to keep. The so splash screen is usually one that you'll want to keep in your model before you issue it out of the office. So it's worth noting that eTransmit, although it does a purge of unused objects, uh, it only does one pass. It's always good practice. 
while you've got the model open, go in and do another one or two passes of your purge. Then save that model file to wherever you keep your published information on your network, give it a name. It's worth noting here under options, you'll see that the option for central model is greyed out, deselected because you don't have work sharing on, and that's now ready for sending to somebody else. Okay, work sharing monitor. The last few are quite quick. This is a favourite of mine. Um, again, it comes packaged in Revit 2018 as standard. Previously, it's there for all of those who are on subscription or some sort of contract. Very useful if you're on a work sharing project. So, most projects these days, you'll be more than one person working on it, set up so that you can work at the same time with a central file and making local copies. What this allows you to do is monitor who's working on it at any given time. Helps you to manage requests and notifications in a more easy way. And one I like is you can view some of the performance data on the model. So again, demonstration. Uh, just to see the comparison, if I open first a model that isn't work sharing. Just to show you what the work sharing monitor will, will say. So we launch the app. And you'll see here there's no work shared files open. So that tells you the model you're looking at with the work sharing hasn't been set up. So we go set up work sharing so you understand exactly what that means. Turn on the collaborate. And then you'll see your work sets are all set up and you're set up for work sharing. So let's have a look at the work sharing monitor now. Oh no, sorry, first of all, obviously you need to save your project. And this will be your central file. So when you have a look in options, what you'll see is work sharing again is greyed out, but it's set to on by default. You can't change it because you've enabled the work sets. So, now we'll have a look at the work sharing monitor, I think. And you'll see here, this is something I quite like. It's highlighted in red because you're working in a central file and anyone does working on uh, central models should know this is an absolute no-no. You never work on a central file. And it's useful to see as well if anybody else is doing that. So now you'll see that it's a central file and we can create a local copy. And again, we'll have a look in that work sharing monitor. <coughs> and you can see who else is working on it at the same time. We've got some nice options. Let's talk through those briefly. You can set this, if you've got two screens, you can set this to be on in front of other applications. And then you've got a whole series of alerts that you can configure to come on or not come on. Now here you have a place where you can monitor your requests and notifications. You can do this in Revit anyway, but this is just a little bit more easy. And as I say, I like this one here, system performance. So if you're having trouble with the speed of your synchronizing or you're opening a model, it's good to have a look in here, see what it's doing in terms of memory and in your network speeds. Okay. So a model review, very simple model checking tool. Pales in comparison with some of the stuff Mike's just been talking about. But as I say, it comes in with your subscription contract and it's now free in Revit 2018. Very good kind of entry level model um, sort of review check-in tool. It will check your model and produce little reports on various parts of your model. You can set it up to look for things through accuracy and consistency, just general good practice, and particularly adherence to standards that might be configured to look at your company standards or bridge standards or AEC UK standards, however you want to set it up. And it also includes some correction options for certain checks.
So a quick look at that. Yeah. Just briefly look at, there's five um, predefined check sets. which should be very useful to run quick early checks on your model. I'll show you what they're made up of if we go into the manage section. Here you have your five predefined sets of checks. And you can use one of those as a starting point. You can go through and meddle around with all kinds of checks. You can make them as elaborate or as simple as you like. You can apply filters. And really it will take some time to get your head around what all of these things do. Make it as um, elaborate or simple as you like. A useful feature is you can set conditions against those checks. And you can also set what message you want to put in if a check fails, and likewise if a check passes, and that's what it will produce in your error report at the end. Now, the way this works is a little bit convoluted, but first of all, um, your profile will have those five check sets of checks in it. If you do any changes, you make your own check set, you need to save it, and it could be somewhere on your company's network for other people to use, but within the project, if you're specifically using on that project. And once you've saved it, you then need to add it to your profile. So this is on your computer. Once that's now part of your profile, so there is other things you can set up. So let's just do the um, the output folder and yeah, other things. So when you're done, you can exit the manage section, and go and run a check. And as you'll see here, as well as your five predefined ones, you've now got the check set that you've made and added to your profile. And you can go and run that check on your model. There's two ways that you can approach setting up checks with any kind of model audit thing. You could have some that are on your uh, server for using in many different projects or you can have one that's specifically within the project that can evolve and develop over the life of the project itself. At the end of it you get a nice little error report, or sorry, a uh, audit report <coughs> as it were, which you can export out to a HTML file. And then with what you do with that HTML file at the end, something that is worth having a look at another previous presentation that Kevin uh, Fielden did earlier this year and the kind of things you can do with your model check reports it's worth looking at okay we out of time right, okay well I'll skip this one then Summarizing. essentially what this one will do is it, it's um, rather than bringing Revit model directly into Revit sorry directly into Navisworks and it creating a file there, you can set it up, you can configure it better within Revit, so it's not bringing everything into the model. So you're exporting only what you want then to bring into Navisworks. And it's also got a great little um, tool for isolating something, uh, objects within Navisworks, switching back into Revit, creating a section box around it so you can get right at, for instance, two objects that are within a clash. So let's skip that then. Finally, yeah, all I wanted to do is, uh, well, hopefully it's been of some use to you and really just wanted to put a call out for anyone else who's been using add-ins to come in future presentations, see if you can show us what you've been doing, whether it's a more longer presentation or just to add something to our for the tips and tricks. Okay. Does, any, does anyone develop their own add-ins? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, <you> <laughs> As, as Matthew was saying, it would be really, really good to keep on the theme of this. We've been doing Revit tips and tricks now for 24 meetings. To be honest, we're running out of tips and tricks. <laughs> <laughs>
So, uh, I, I, I think this is a really, really good idea. If you've got add-ins and things that are really, really useful to you on a daily basis that you just, th those things that are that $20, 20 quid thing or 100 quid thing that actually you find save you a day's worth of work, half a day's worth of work, that's the sort of thing we want to hear about. Uh, those things can be massive efficiency gains for us in this, for, for, for everybody. So um, do email us on committee at emerald.co.uk and, and, and we would love to see you up at the front just for five minutes and just actually presenting you know, your favorite application, your favorite thing that you use. Um, uh, would be really, really, I think everyone would find that very, very useful. So do have a think about it uh, and send us an email just to, um, uh, to put that idea forward.